Hi guys, Dr. Glenn from Surgical Teaching here, and welcome to this video on chest x-rays made easy. Chest x-rays are one of the most commonly performed first-line investigations, performed in patients admitted to the emergency room. Therefore, it's essential that you have a good understanding of when they're indicated, how to identify the normal anatomy, and also how to systematically analyze chest x-rays to spot any abnormalities. And by the end of this video, that's exactly what you'll be able to do. But before we carry on, don't forget to like, subscribe, and turn on those notifications so you don't miss out on any of our new content releases. There are lots of indications for performing chest x-rays. However, essentially, the main divisions of indications include chest symptoms, such as the patient being short of breath, hypoxic, having a productive cough, chest pain, and also having a fever with no obvious cause for which you'd want to exclude an occult chest infection. Additionally, we also want to exclude other chest pathology, for example, effusions and pulmonary edema. Then we have the trauma patient, which would involve performing an AP view, which we undertake to look for the presence of any hemothorax, pneumothorax, any gross rib fractures or a flail chest. We also perform chest x-rays for patients with acute abdominal pain. We do this to look for any evidence of free air that may be sitting under the diaphragm, and we call this pneumoperitoneum. When we see this, it's indicative of a perforation of the GI tract. It's important to remember that because air and gas rises, it means that we need to position the patient sitting up in an erect position prior to undertaking this x-ray to enable any free air within the abdominal cavity to make its way up to lie underneath the diaphragm and therefore allow us to see it. When we perform chest x-rays, there are three views that we tend to use. Anterior-posterior, or AP, which basically means the photon beams are fired from the patient's front through to their back. Then the reverse of that is the posterior-anterior, or PA in which the x-rays are beamed from the back of the patient through to their front. We can also perform a lateral view, or side-on view, which while still having limited use, has largely been superseded by other imaging modalities, such as CT. So we're only going to focus on the more common AP and PA views for the rest of this talk. Although both the AP and PA views create a very similar picture, there is a significant difference to be aware of, which makes it important to know which view has been used in taking the image. Essentially, when the X-ray beams leave the machine on their way to the subject, they spread out, as you can see here. This is important because when you take X-ray images using the AP view, with the patient facing the X-ray beams, it means that you get magnification of anterior lying structures, such as the heart. So if we were to take a chest x-ray with a PA view, because the patient will be facing away from the machine, the heart would be close to the detector and therefore won't be magnified by the spreading out beams. It's because of the fact that AP views can falsely cause the appearance of an enlarged heart or cardiomegaly that we prefer to perform chest x-rays with the PA view. However, because this involves the patient being able to stand still with their chest against the detector, it isn't always possible, particularly in trauma patients or bed-bound and critically unwell patients. So in these cases, it's important to be aware of the fact that their heart will be artificially magnified. Moving on to how we analyse chest x-rays, the first thing that we need to do is to perform a general check. Then we need to analyse the quality of the image and follow this on by looking at the anatomy and attempting to identify any abnormalities. Whilst we're going to look at the second and third part of the interpretation separately, they can be remembered as one combined thing by remembering the mnemonic A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H and I, which we'll discuss in detail very shortly. For the general check, we want to clarify the patient's age, sex, and also what's the history of the patient. So basically, what's the reason for us actually performing the chest x-ray in the first place? Then, we want to check the type of view. So is it AP, P, 
PA? Or lateral? And also, what's the orientation? So which is the patient's left side, and which is their right? Now thankfully, all chest x-rays should come with one of these sides marked, usually the left side. The last thing we want to look at in the general check is we want to see if this is an erect chest x-ray or if the patient's lying flat. As I mentioned earlier, we can remember the analysis of the quality of the image and then looking at the anatomy for abnormalities by remembering the mnemonic A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H and I. So pretty straightforward. A refers to analysing the quality of the image. To do this, we first want to make sure the lungs are adequately inflated and that we're able to visualise the maximum amount of lung tissue. In an adequately inflated chest, either the 5th, 6th or 7th anterior ribs should cross the diaphragm along the midclavicular line. So in this case, we can say that the chest is adequately inflated. We next want to check to see if the x-ray is rotated. To do this, we identify the spinous processes of the vertebrae and also the two heads of the clavicles. In a non-rotated chest x-ray, the spinous processes should sit neatly between the two clavicular heads. And here we can see that this is the case in our image. So we can say that our image isn't rotated. Lastly, we want to check to see if the image is under or over penetrated. Essentially, penetration refers to the degree that the x-ray beams have passed through the body. So if the general penetration of the x-ray is less than necessary, it can lead to a poorly exposed image in which we have significant loss of detail. Now, with modern digital x-ray machines, this is definitely much less of an issue than it used to be, but it's still really important to check. In a well-penetrated image, the vertebral column should be visible just behind the heart, which as you can see, is definitely the case in our image. So all in all, we can say that we're very happy with the quality of this image. Now that we've undertaken the general check and we've analysed the image quality, we're OK to proceed to look at the anatomy of the chest x-ray and also look for any abnormalities. Now, as we've mentioned, it's really important to be systematic when we review the anatomy and look for any abnormalities. So as tempting as it is, don't just focus on the lungs. By being systematic, it means that if you do identify an abnormality, you can make a note of it, but carry on and complete your full assessment. And this means that you're much less likely to miss anything else important. Going back to our mnemonic, A stands for analysing the quality of the image. B refers to bone and soft tissue. C is cardiac, so the heart. D is the diaphragm. E is effusions. F is the fields of the lungs and its fissures. G refers to the great vessels. H is hyla and mediastinum. And lastly, I is impression. So basically, what do we think is going on? Starting with B, we're going to look at the bones and soft tissues. In terms of soft tissues, in females, we should normally be able to see bilateral breast tissue present. But in both sexes, we should also be reviewing the neck and the axilla to look for any masses or even metallic surgical clips if the patient's undergone any surgery in those areas, such as a thyroidectomy or an axillary node clearance. We can now move on to C, which as we know, stands for cardiac. So we want to review the heart to check its position, size and its configuration. Next in our mnemonic, we have D, which is the diaphragm. So we start by checking the shape and its position. And remember that the right hemidiaphragm will normally sit slightly higher than the left due to the presence of the liver underneath it. And also, we should be inspecting under the diaphragm to check for the presence of any pneumoperitoneum. We can now move on to E, 
which refers to effusions. But also, we'll look at the plural spaces for the presence of any pneumothorax. Starting with effusions, they can be a hemothorax, pus, or other exudates or transudates. For example, a chylothorax. In the erect chest x-ray, the fluid typically accumulates around the costophrenic angles, as you can see here. Now looking at pneumothoraces, if they're only small, they may actually only be evident by the presence of a small sliver of air present at the apex of the pleural cavity. However, in large pneumothoraces, it's often far more obvious, as you can see here. Next in the mnemonic is F, which stands for fields and fissures of the lungs. It's important that when we inspect the lungs, we divide them into three zones and describe any abnormalities based upon their location within these zones. So we have the upper zone, the middle zone, and the lower zone. Now, this isn't the same as the lobes of the lungs, as obviously we only have two on the left side anyway, but it's just a nice way of dividing and presenting your assessment. The other point to make is, as you can see, the lower zone extends inferiorly and posteriorly to the diaphragm. And this is because of the convexity of the diaphragm itself. And it means that any abnormalities in these lower zones may potentially be obscured and missed because of the presence of the diaphragm. When looking at the lungs, the main things that we're looking for are any nodules or masses, any diffuse abnormalities, such as consolidation from an infection, we can review the pulmonary vascular pattern and also attempt to identify any fluid that's collecting in the fissures. Moving on to G, we're going to look at the great vessels. This involves reviewing the aorta, so first identifying the knuckle of the aorta and the descending thoracic aorta, which lies inferior to it, which in cases of aortic dissection may allow you to see a widened aorta on the chest x-ray. We should also look to identify the pulmonary vessels, the superior vena cava, and the azygous vein. Next up, we have the hilum and the mediastinum. The right and left hilum are actually pretty complicated anatomical areas, because as well as containing the pulmonary vessels, they also contain the main bronchi and some lymph nodes. Now, normally, we should be able to visualize the main bronchi and the pulmonary vessels. However, when we can easily identify the lymph nodes, that's usually indicative of the presence of lymphadenopathy. Typically, from an underlying condition such as TB or sarcoidosis. Now moving on to the mediastinum. The key thing that we want to check now is to look for the position of the trachea. As you can see in this case, the trachea is nicely positioned centrally as it should be. However, it may become deviated in the presence of a tension pneumothorax or from the mass effect of a large pulmonary pathology. And this brings us to the last letter of the mnemonic, which is I, which as we know, stands for the impression. So having analysed the chest x-ray using our stepwise approach, we should now be in a position to state our impression of the image. So what do we think is going on? This is actually a really useful step to undertake, even in a normal chest x-ray, as it helps you to analyse all the information and acts as a means of double-checking that you haven't skipped any of the steps and may have missed anything. In summary of what we've covered in this tutorial, we covered the different views that we can use and how AP views can magnify the anterior chest structures, such as the heart. We also spent some time looking at the systematic way in which we can actually review the chest x-ray. So, after performing the general check, we can use the mnemonic A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H and I to analyse the quality of the image and then the various anatomical regions before finally coming up with our impression and our diagnosis. And lastly, we discussed the pros and cons of chest x-rays and importantly, how the fact that we are exposing the patient to radiation, albeit a very low dose, 
means that we should only perform this investigation when absolutely indicated. If you found this video helpful, then make sure you subscribe to our channel for more great free content. Or if you want to make learning for med school and board exams easier, then subscribe to surgicalteaching.com and check out our expert endorsed videos, high yield revision questions, and our supportive online community. Surgical Teaching was designed by doctors to help students learn smarter. And right now, you can enjoy all of our great content for less, with 20% off our annual premium subscriptions when using the code STYouTube20. Thanks for watching, guys, and I'll see you soon.